Thank you everyone for joining us for our third um, and final of a three-part panel series with patient and public partners. Uh, today we have Empo Begin and Juanita Garcia um, from CHI's Patient and Public Engagement Collaborative Partnership. This session is titled Practical Tips and Tools for Online Patient Engagement. And this panel is part of the Center for Healthcare Innovation's Patient and Public Engagement Lunchtime Learning Series, which is a self-approved group learning section one activity defined as defined by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, and it's eligible for one credit hour. It's also eligible for uh, credit through the uh, Manitoba, College, uh, Manitoba Association of Pharmacists, I think it's called, and um, those in nursing. We will be recording this panel and we will share on CHI's YouTube channel. The link is in the chat box. Um, how the panel works, your audio and video are muted. Um, our panelists will have a chance to share their perspectives, lived experience and recommendations. And then at the end, we'll have time for discussion and questions. If you're having difficulty hearing or would like to follow along with subtitles, you can turn those on in the more options at the bottom of your screen. And here we are, um, CHI is in Winnipeg. Uh, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 1 land, which is the home of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. We recognize the ongoing present-day colonial violence faced by Indigenous people within our systems, governments, and institutions. We dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And in talking about patient and public engagement in health research, it is in fact Indigenous research methodologies that are at the forefront and Indigenous scholars, researchers, and communities that we should be looking to for guidance. Here at CHI, um, if you don't already know us, this is our patient engagement team. Uh, Carolyn Shimon, our lead, Ogai Sherzoi, a knowledge broker in patient engagement, and myself, uh, Trish Roach, I'm also a knowledge broker. Um, in terms of conflict of interest, the PE team, we are paid employees of CHI, and Juanita and Empo are members of our collaborative partnership, and we have no other conflicts of interest to disclose today. And I will begin by introducing Empo. So she earned a master's degree in computer engineering from the University of Manitoba. She's a professional engineer, registered with Engineers Geoscientists Manitoba, and she works for Arxium, a medical device company, and is also an entrepreneur developing an innovative mobile health platform. She's involved in the community as a board member for the Grace Hospital Foundation, as a committee member of the Immigrant and Refugee Community Organization of Manitoba, or IRCOM, and former chair, co-chair of the Collaborative Partnership. Um, she also sits on CHI's Executive Council. And so I'm going to stop screen sharing so that as recommended by uh, feedback from our participants um, and then give Empo a chance to share some tips, insights, um, practical tools and thoughts on engaging online. So please uh, go ahead Empo. Thank you Patricia and thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Um, I had uh, two uh, points. One was uh, uh, barriers on different groups, uh, how different groups they face are uh, engaging uh, virtually. Uh, I believe that one was covered pretty well in the last two sessions and I encourage everybody who haven't seen those two sessions to uh, visit them. Um, Angela had a very good um, um, I just have talked about, about, about the belongingness when it comes to patient engagement and some of the barriers she touched on uh, on the level of access patients have uh, to technology and uh, that some have no Wi-Fi. And Maggie talked about the cultural and language barriers. And in the second session, uh, we had uh, Thomas, Abu and Rasi who talked about uh, meaning, meaning, meaningful connections with the immigrants, newcomers, refugees and indigenous, indigenous peoples and touch on communication barriers. So, um, so that kind of ties in in what I'm going to talk about in terms of technology. I won't talk much more about the barriers because those are already covered in the last two sessions. So uh, today I'll just focus on uh, the use of technology to engage patients, especially in this uh, uh, time where we are doing uh, social distancing. 
So I can imagine um, uh, this pandem pandemic affected you as well uh, with, your with your research. You're not able to uh, engage uh, your patient partners uh, face to face. So this is where technology can be helpful to, uh, uh, to uh, keep that engagement going uh, with, with your patients. Uh, whether you're, you're still working on a project or your project has been on hold, you because of the pandemic, uh, I think it's still uh, good to uh, still uh, engage with our patients and uh, keep that connection uh, uh, going. So um, in terms of technology itself, uh, there are so many technologies out there. Uh, when using technologies, it's very uh, good to be mindful um, of the type of uh, technology you're going to use in, uh, to engage patients. Uh, keep in mind that uh, technology is just a tool that you use to uh, help you achieve something. Um, so uh, two questions that I think you should be asking yourself when deciding what type of technology you're gonna be using is uh, uh, number one, what am I trying to achieve uh, by using this tool? And also what message is coming across uh, from, me, from me using this tool? Um, when engaging with patients at this time, also keep in mind that other aspects of their lives uh, went online too. So, um, you know, people started working from home and uh, they're doing uh, homeschooling. There's also extracurricular activities that are going online. So everything's going online. So at this point, fatigue is starting to kick in. So people are getting getting overwhelmed with uh, being uh, uh, on video calls all the time. Um, so when I think about uh, engaging patients, uh, think about the the level of engagement you are, you are, you are, you are trying to achieve. Um, so decide if uh, you need to do video conferencing or uh, if there's any other tools you can you can use that are not as uh, online, that kind of offline, like is, is email enough or just a phone call is enough um, when engaging patients. And if, uh, if it, so this is also something that you need to kind of um, check in with the, check with the, with the patients as well, what, what, what they're comfortable with uh, in terms of using uh, what to, so, um, and if you decide to engage with patients uh, using uh, video conferencing, uh, such as Zoom, um, you know, just keep in mind that uh, everybody right now is using Zoom. So we use it for, for work, uh, for school, uh, for other, like I mentioned, other activities. So that can kind of set anxiety because everybody now is tired of uh, being on Zoom uh, all the time. Uh, take example for myself, like I'm working from home, so it's, it's not that common for me to be on, on, on Zoom meetings uh, during the day for like four or five times. And then at the end of the day, you know, my daughter has to do dance and uh, acting, so there's, those, those are on, 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 um, on Zoom as well. So it's kind of seven to eight meetings on Zoom, so that can be exhausting. So to put that, if you want to engage with patients and do, do another Zoom uh, also by the end of the day, so that can, that can be overwhelming. So um, I know there's lots of uh, technologies out there that uh, in terms of video conferencing, um, they all do the same thing, but uh, keep in mind also they, they do serve a different purpose. Um, take for example, Zoom, like everybody's using Zoom right now, but we usually associate that Zoom as a, as a business transaction or as a, as, a, as a work thing. So if people are going on, on Zoom all the time, they're gonna feel like they're working nonstop. So if, 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 you, haven't, if you are just starting to, um, to start engaging patients online, I will probably encourage to look at other alternatives um, uh, besides Zoom. Um, uh, for example, if you, if you have Skype, you know, that's another alternative. Um, there's uh, also Slack or Google Teams that you know people can may, may be open to using instead of our uh, Zoom because our uh, Zoom now we, we now have what we call a Zoom fatigue. Every time people hear Zoom, you know, they start 
that cause anxiety because that they are online all the time. So maybe other alternatives are like Slack and Skype. They, they won't be, they won't feel overwhelmed by being uh, uh, online. The other thing is that you want to, uh, your patients to be comfortable um, Interacting online uh, online is very different than doing face to face um, because face to face usually there's uh, if you are online usually you need to do uh, you need to focus more because you can see the person talking so um, so if you're on, on, on online you know you have to kind of read the um, nonverbal communication like body language uh, the tone and um, and the and the um, Yeah, the tone of the, 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 the tone of the voice of the person speaking. So that kind of take a lot of um, of um, that needs a lot of focus for, 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 for the patient. So that can be exhausting. So um, we're not doing online interactions. So it's very good to um, kind of limit how long uh, you're gonna do the, um, the the online conversation. If you used to do like a two hour um, um, face to face talk, discuss with your patients whether to shorten that because being online for two two hours is a long time. You can do maybe multiple uh, meetings, uh, shorter ones. Uh, if you decide to use video conferencing, also make it optional to um, for to use camera because some customers, some, some patients are, don't feel. Uh, comfortable uh, using um, a video, and also like the previous panel, panels talk about, people don't. Some people don't like to to have people see where they are living. So if they use the camera, it's easy to people to see what they what what the patient's house is like. So there's some patients won't feel comfortable with that. Um, also, when engaging patients, there are the, this is a very stressful time. So, instead, so if you are going to engage uh, before you jump into business and talking business, check in first with with your patients, see how they are doing and how they are coping. That will also help them can relax, reduce the anxiety, and build that relationship first before you um, uh, before you 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 do anything. Um, also, that uh, so flexibility. Uh, I mentioned that uh, people are very busy now. Uh, so, if uh, there could be conflicts when trying to schedule as uh, um, some uh, meetings online, so it's very uh, being flexible with your time is uh, is very crucial to be able to engage um, uh, the patients. So, oh, I don't know if I missed anything here. So there could be challenges uh, uh, when using technology um, um, to engage patients. Um, one be internet ac uh, access that's been previously discussed. So it can so instead of uh, doing video, you can yeah just use a phone. That's still fine. There are also technical glitches that can happen um, when, when uh, communicating with technology. So you need to be able to uh, to deal with that. And also, depending on the group that you are trying to engage, uh, you know, every group uh, use technology different. Uh, sometimes, if you are like, if I engage with seniors, um, I know seniors sometimes they, they they are known to like video conferencing to be able to, you know, engage with um, some seniors may be feeling lonely, so video conferencing might be good for them to be able to see other people's faces. But if you are doing engaging with youths, uh, for example, you know, they are uh, video conferencing or something that they like, they probably prefer uh, more like uh, text messaging, uh, uh, like uh, using uh, Slack or, or WhatsApp or Skype. So depending, so depending on, the, um, on the group you are trying to engage, it's very good, it's uh, best to be able to uh, check what kind of technology they are comfortable with. And also, people, people uh, patients have different type of te of uh, technology in terms of hardware. Uh, whether they are using um, uh, iPhone or uh, Android, or they have tablets, all those uh, different uh, uh, tools, uh, technologies. Uh, uh, they have different uh, apps you can use. So it depends on what uh, what comfort level your patients have. 
So I think that's all I had in terms of uh, um, tips and suggestions. So I will stop here and then uh, answer any questions you have later on. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Empo. Um, and I, if you notice too, we have uh, one of the practical things we've done at the request of our patient partners is provide these um, uh, conveniently branded uh, backgrounds, <laughs> <laughs> so you see, so you can see Empo and I are virtually in the same space, but not actually. <laughs> Thanks so much, Empo. Thank you. And. Um, we also have with us today uh, Juanita Garcia. She is a dedicated student at the University of Manitoba. She values the importance of individuals' voices being present and heard in the research process. Uh, Juanita has experience both as a patient and in clinical research and brings those dual perspectives to the collaborative partnership. Um, so I'll give you a chance, Juanita, to um, share your perspectives on what kind of tips, tools, um, practical things people should think about when engaging online. Thank you, Trish, for the introduction, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, so, yeah, my name is Juanita. So, as Trish said, I'm a student at the University of Manitoba. I'm starting my fourth year in the fall. Um, and right now, I'm working in a research lab doing research on spinal cord injury. Um, so, virtually, but <laughs> still doing some research. Um, and then I wanted to talk about, about my experience engaging with research, both as a patient and also um, as a young student. I find that a lot of times it's really hard to engage, kind of to bridge that gap in between researchers and patients, and also to get young people into research and um, to kind of show people that, and patients that research is a lot more than just building uh, in a microbial lab and pipetting bacteria. Uh, and it just goes way beyond that. So, so first of all, I think um, something that has helped me a lot engage in terms of research, uh, engaging patients is, um, I think, looking for those opportunities. I think that a lot of times we don't know that there's opportunities there and also like from the side of a patient, you don't know that there's all these many researchers like doing things that actually are going to benefit you or for you, uh, as well as from the other side, you might not be aware that there's all these patients that would be willing to engage with your research, but there's like this lack of communication um, or yeah, for a better sense, I guess, that it's kind of like no one knows who to approach first, in a sense. Um, so I think from my experience, for example, I was uh, from like eight years ago, uh, I was diagnosed with this illness. And then afterwards, I never, it was a very rare, rare illness. And then I, it was kind of like, well, I'm this alone. And then I don't know anyone with this also. So, and you don't know that all these researchers exist. And also like me, I was 13. So it's kind of like, I don't really know that all these things happen in the outside world for a sense. So then uh, it took me about like four years until I finally found a group where I found like researchers who did research in this. And looking back, it's like, well, why did it take me that long? But it's kind of like, no one told me that there was research groups. No one told me that there were um, like groups online or organizations that I could join where I could contact researchers or where researchers were given their, um, like would contact patients or uh, engage patients in their, in their projects. So, so I think it would have been really interesting, like looking back to be able to start engaging in the research and to find out that there's people doing all these, all these things, especially that ultimately like benefit us patients um, way like earlier, kind of in the most in the most acute phases or like the most critical phases when you when you just start kind of finding out your way in this new situation. Um, so I think in terms of like uh, all this pandemic has the technology has actually benefited us in a way that 
now you can contact all these we like from these groups i've contacted researchers from the states and other parts of canada um and i guess like before it would have been a lot harder to say oh can we have like a video call like it's kind of like not a normal thing um uh, like before you would find video calls to just kind of just facetime with your friends and pretty much it uh but it'd be like joining a webinar like you would think of that as more high tech stuff that you're like oh, i don't really know how to do this too scared to join a webinar like not not really sure how to manage that uh but now thanks to COVID, i feel like a lot of people are now much more comfortable with technology with um apps like zoom and things like that and like they see while well, joining a webinar isn't that bad like it's not it's not super intimidating now um as it was months ago or years ago so i think now uh engaging patients who are also in other places of the world it's it's going to be much easier in a sense because people are more like getting used to this oh can we have like a video conference or or like an online um support group in a sense kind of thing so for example like thanks to these organizations that i found uh there's been a lot of webinars and um like talk nights uh where let's say a researcher will come in into this webinar and then it's kind of just a very casual um talk but there's people from all over the uh all over the states all over canada and it's it's an opportunity to ask the researcher okay like what have like what are you doing right now and like the researcher um also uh, promotes like their projects and tells us uh okay i might need like some people if uh they're willing to share how like their treatment or share their different perspectives on what can be done what needs to be done like what are you feeling um which also in terms of being isolated i think helps a lot as it helps us feel more um engaged in a in a space not be so in our own world um and also as patients i think it helps us know that there's other people who kind of care about this um and also other people who are going through the same thing that i am going uh which is very important i think so so i think a lot of my big tip is searching um like just search in every word in google um like that's how i ended up finding all these groups um like the organizations and for example i ended up finding uh this facebook group with thousands of people um who have like similar stuff and it's kind of like oh wow like so interesting to finally kind of meet someone even though it's not in person um who you can share your experience and then and then through this i've also been able to like participate and can, and also find out about uh like things that ultimately are good for me um and then i think also that all this has allowed to engage more young people into research because i find that sometimes it's like oh there's i don't know this research um opportunity or um this yeah this opportunity to engage patients but then you have to like drive all the way somewhere or it's like oh well it's in the middle of the day like it's good just going to mess up all my schedule or things like that uh while now having things virtually i think helps a lot to to get those young people who are maybe sometimes uh, i don't want to say lazy but not super willing to just drive 2 hours and sit in a room with other strangers uh but it kind of from being in the comfort of your home they might be more willing to participate in in research and i think that as a young patient uh giving your perspective is pretty important because um ultimately like a lot of the research that's being done right now it's going to affect all the young people who are well going to move into this next generation um so ultimately like yes it it might affect uh the, like the older patients who might be the ones who usually participate in focus groups uh and things like that but the needs from these older patients might be completely diff- different than the needs from from the youth groups who who are also facing um yeah are facing another a different set of of difficulties 
Um, and then one last thing I want to say, it's kind of, I think also there's so many opportunities as patients that sometimes we miss just because we don't know about them and because we don't search. So, and we might think like, oh, no one's going to like, who would pro who would be interested in like, oh, no one's, no one's probably doing research in this or like, or like, yeah, like no one's going to be interested in, in this, but then searching for, for ways to connect and kind of be fearless in a sense of, of sending an email out and, and trying to connect with the researcher being like, oh, I'm interested in this. Um, it's, it's doable and it's, it shouldn't be like as intimidating as, as the world paints it. And on the other hand, same like other way from researchers connected, pa connecting patients. Um, sometimes I feel like researchers will find it really hard, like, oh, my patients might not be interested in this and, or like they won't respond to my emails or, or things like that. But maybe it's the way that the message, the message is coming across. So I think that painting, like seeing the re as a patient, as a patient, being able to see the research as something that is going to benefit you instead of just seeing it as, oh, I'm just helping the researcher by being in their project or by being in their committee. Um, it just changes how you see things and it mo motivates you to like to participate. If I see that by participating in this committee, by participating in this focus group, I am going to benefit myself, then I'm probably more likely to say, okay, yes, I'll give two hours of my time to do this. than if I'm just like, oh, well, I'll just join because this researcher asked me to and I just want to like, and it's really going to benefit me, but there's no benefit for benefit them, but there's no benefit for me. So I think um, how, how um, you approach the patients in order to engage them also influences a lot their willingness and their motivation to participate and to give uh, meaningful knowledge and like meaningful um, information that will ultimately guide the research and may change the path of the research in different ways. And I think that's it for you. That's great. I, I like how you, we have, you know, there's two sides to this COVID. Um, it's awful. It's terrible. It's a pandemic. Um, but I, I appreciate trying to find some positives where we can um, in how resilient we are as humans and how we're still able to um, stay connected as much as we can. And yeah, now everybody's used to video conferencing. Yay. <laughs> and um, I think it's interesting too, you're in discussing about how, you know, um, physicians or researchers might assume that, um, patients aren't interested or have to find a new way to approach it. Like, I think what I heard from you was a lot of like, don't make assumptions that people don't want to be involved or that um, don't make assumptions that researchers aren't interested in your condition just because it's rare. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think a big uh, point there is sometimes as patients, we might feel not a left out, but it's just like, we don't know what's happening on the other side of the research, if that makes any sense. Like the researcher might be doing all this and I'm sure I would be really happy to find about all this, but well, I don't know about them. So like, I have no way of finding that out, but maybe they could find out, could like find, uh, look for the patients and tell them about this, which would it's kind of like a circle overall. Um, but I think a lot of times yeah, there's like that lack of communication that makes makes us patients and researchers make assumptions that are probably completely untrue. Um, so I think trying to bridge that gap is it's really important. That's an excellent point. Um, we have some comments uh, in the chat box, um, though I don't think any of them are specific questions yet. Um, and I think part of this practical discussion um, where we're bringing up platforms, it's relevant as well. Um, you know, uh, Isabel Jordan says, encourage asking patient partners what their preferred platform is. And that's what we've heard from both of you. Um, 
people might feel overloaded if they have to master many different technologies. Every new one is a challenge. What are your thoughts on that, Juanita? On the number of different platforms? I think uh, it's a good thing to ask people what they're comfortable with. For example, like I feel really good at Zoom, like we used it a lot. Um, but for example, I had to use WebEx for some of my classes at the beginning. And it's obviously a learning curve, uh, especially depending on what type of patients you're trying to engage. I think how Empo was saying, it's very different trying to engage um, young people who might be way much faster at learning how all these technology stuff works and all these different platforms that might be very intimidating than getting young people to, to learn to use them. Um, but I think that kind of once you learn how to use one, it's pretty like, oh, I'll try to, it's kind of like it becomes your new comfort zone in a sense. Um, for example, I know we've had like family meetings with like my grandparents and all my uncles and that. And uh, it took us a while to get everyone to learn how to use Zoom. Um, but then once we finally, for example, got my grandparents like set up on Zoom, then my uncle was like, well, we should maybe switch to Skype. And everyone was like, no, 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 no. It already took us a while on Zoom. So, so kind of like they're comfortable there already. So, so I think asking the patient like what they're comfortable with and, and if they, if they want to switch and try a new one, well, that would be great. But also I feel like maybe trying to set a new, like a new account or, or downloading this new software might even give them like more anxiety and like, it might be even more intimidating. So like when they get to, when they get to the panel or whatever they're, they're joining, it's like, well, I'm already stressed more than I should be. So, so I think that part of that info was saying to like asking them what their preferred is, um, it's super important. And um, someone mentioned hearing, learning about from Teams uh, Discord, which uh, I know you mentioned like with youth, maybe less, willing or desiring to want to do video conferences. So I think things like Discord, are you familiar with it or Reddit even, I would say, um, myself uh, as in, you know, as a person with lived experience of health conditions, I've found research to be involved in through actually um, chat forums on Reddit. So are there any others like those that you can think of or? Um, I've mainly those? like relied on Facebook a lot. Um, kind of like old school now, but, <laughs> but I think Facebook is, that's kind of like where I found most of, most of the things. Um, Reddit sometimes, but I don't go in it a lot. And Discord, I didn't know that it was like, yeah, that it was more than, a, um, like I used it for a group uh, chat for a group, for a class, for a group project. But like, other than that, I never looked into it anymore. So I think that's also like, sometimes you don't know that all these platforms exist. So you could be missing on all this knowledge out there and all these other opportunities that, that are there, but you don't know about all these, yeah, to not like Reddit or Discord or even like Facebook or Twitter, who knows. And there's so many, I keep learning about more every day. I'm like, they don't need to make any more, <laughs> let's, let's stop. <laughs> oh, and uh, apparently Discord can do both chat and video. Um, so another comment we have uh, from Aileen Silva from Brazil, she says, congratulations on this initiative with a great diverse panel, a very relevant discussion. Um, she says, it's interesting because here in Brazil, the patient engagement in the decision making on new technology incorporation is only through online public consultation, but they are trying to find more participative ways than only uh, consulting people. And she believes this moment could be an opportunity to test online tools for more participatory social involvement. Empo, do you have any ideas on like what would be more participatory? Are we thinking of like ways to make decisions through online or do you have any thoughts on that? If not, that's okay. <laughs> uh, making decisions online. Um... I think there are tools uh, that already exist uh, for team uh, team collaboration. Um, Google Drive for sharing and um, being able to work on the same uh, uh, same document. I think that's one way to 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 make decisions online. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with Slack. Too Slack is also uh, 
good in terms of uh, collaboration. Um, so, yeah. I don't think uh, things like uh, patient engagement, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there's already technologies that already exist. We just have to repurpose them for what you need them for. Yeah. Yeah, the tools already exist. It's just being creative and finding yeah. ways to use them and make sure they're accessible, right, for patient partners and they're comfortable with it. Exactly. Um, I'm just thinking question. now oh, because sorry, uh, uh, for now with the social distancing and pandemic, uh, there's uh, everybody's uh, online school, uh, everything is going online school. So all the parents that have to have already set up with uh, Google accounts for, for classroom. So uh, all these other tools like Google Hangouts and Google Drive is already part of the of that platform. So they can just reuse the, the, the same platform that they use for learning for, for patient engagements. Don't reinvent the wheel. <laughs> Key tip. <laughs> um, and we have a question from Rich Sobel. Uh, he says, if I'm a researcher, how do I find young patients that might become partners on my research team? What is the most popular way to contact young people? Where would I get the most return on time investment? Um, I guess that would be for Juanita as the, the, the youngest of our patient partners. Um, I mean, I know you don't speak for all youth, but, um, and Empo, you're welcome to join in if you have thoughts um, on connecting. I know you said Facebook, but. Um, I think, yeah, from my experience, uh, I think I've found a lot from like Instagram and Facebook, especially uh, with me linking to like organizations. Uh, for example, like I linked to an organization in Toronto, like answering TTP, and then they sent um, not weekly emails, but kind of like monthly or something like that, just newsletter. And then they say, okay, um, like there might be, there's researcher that's looking for some board members, or there's this researcher who's working on, um, yeah, trying to make a panel or, or a focus group or something like that. So like, this are the qualifications, like, um, so if you are interested, like, feel free to contact them. So I think uh, being kind of like signed up, if that can be the term, um, to these to these organizations has been really helpful. So I think contacting like organizations that, for example, I guess like Lupus Canada, for example, might be an example. Like there's a lot of people who are with the condition that are kind of signed up to to their platform. So then, um, or like for uh, like, yeah, that's follow them on Instagram or things like that. And then they might be able to be kind of that liaison between the researchers and the patients because I think the patients are way more likely to um, like follow or contact an organization uh, than try to search for individual research, especially sometimes I think trying to well understand the research language is not easy on its own. So it might be actually like intimidating and you try to search like research on this and then all this complicated things come up and you're like, oh, well, I don't understand anything. So I kind of give up on there. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, like be contacting those organizations that can maybe post on their like social media um, and things like that to the patients. It's, it's a great idea. And um, yeah, like also like patient groups, like I know I go keep going back to Facebook, but that's kind of been my, main source um like there's a lot of patient groups with the condition that uh you might be researching or or your research interests so then looking for those groups and just making a post like hi i'm doing this and that and is there any person who's interested in this so that's kind of how um i think most young people have gotten that i know involved through this um yeah and you might even find the unthinkable. For example, I was looking the other day, I was just looking for scholarships. And then I found a scholarship that's specifically for people with my condition. And I was like, well, that's amazing. So, so you never think that I would have never thought that I was going to find something like that. So look and expect the unexpected, I guess. 
That's great. Um, yeah, at, again, like not reinventing the wheel, right? There are already organizations who connect with patients with conditions, things like diabetes, lupus, um, heart disease, right? That have more of that connection that maybe it's best to start there. And I think that makes the most sense. Um, we had a question uh, around thoughts on the maximum number of people for an online focus group. Um, any suggestions for encouraging interaction? Um, so I know for ourselves, um, you know, we probably max out uh, on people being able to engage around 10 to 12 people. Um, and that's even in person, anything beyond that, um, people are feeling left out. Um, and I know even in our own um, collaborative partnership meeting, you know, taking time at the end to specifically ask if people who haven't had a chance to speak had anything they wanted to share. Um, obviously, in this situation, this is a group who already um, are familiar with each other, they're, they've met in person, they're comfortable with each other, so that's not um, too difficult of an ask for them. Um, but I don't know if either of you, Empo or Juanita, have any thoughts, um, or even Carolyn um, or Ogai? Sounds good. That's about. <laughs> I guess that's about right. Yeah, I, th I think that's I think from our experience. Gail, uh, Gail uh, put uh, has a uh, comment there, but a uh, reference that uh, she found as well helpful. So I think that'd be good for everyone to look. Yes, at. check it. Check out Gail's reference. I don't have time to go Google it while we're <laughs> in the meeting to check it, but um, I'm echoing, I guess uh, echoing like Trisha's comment. I think about like ten people. It's like good enough. Uh, also, like I think a lot more would probably just cause like some people to not talk and just like, yeah, they're there, but they're not being able to give their input. So yeah. And at the beginning, like I've joined some, some focus groups or webinars where like I know, and I don't know anyone. So at the beginning, obviously it's just super awkward, uh, especially like before it starts because people are just joining in. You're kind of just staring at each other and it's more awkward than being in person. Um, but, but then like as the conversation goes on, people kind of like let go a bit and start talking a bit more. But yeah, I wouldn't probably do any more than 15, I think at the most. most. Thanks. Uh... Thank you, Anita. Yeah, when thinking about uh, developing your focus group, it's important, especially using online modes of communication in person, like 10 even can be quite a lot. Um, anything with qualitative um, types of studies, like six to seven to 10 is enough to get the diverse perspectives, but online the number could even be less so because um, when we talk to our patient partners, an hour sometimes can be um, very overwhelming to be online. So if you have 10 people or 12 people, that may be a little bit more, because in person is a lot easier to communicate uh, than it is online. So maybe even having less. And I think as time moves forward and more we see focus groups being online, we'll probably have more better ideas what's optimal number for folks. And I was also just thinking to add into that. Um, I think we've learned over time to just having different options for different personality types. I know for myself, I take a while to process things. So making sure you have information ahead of your, your group discussion so that people who take a while to process can and also having options uh, outside of the meeting. So maybe a one on one phone call. Uh, with people who may feel more comfortable uh, taking some time to reflect and then would like to just share their feedback but couldn't do it, maybe didn't feel uh, right within the focus group. So just having multiple options for people, whether it's in writing, whether it's one-on-one -on -one telephone calls or, or in the group so that everyone gets a chance to participate. Sorry, just to add more, uh, even your topic area, sometimes as Carolyn mentioned, it's good to have different options available. Certain topic areas may not be appropriate to do so in a focus group setting. So you might think of different option and that might be more on one-on-one. -on -one, and that's why we encourage uh, patient public engagement in your research team because they can flag some of those things and help you 
develop what methods are best um, under certain topic areas of your research. And I just had one question, if that's okay to ask. Um, Empo and Juanita, you did such a wonderful job of really helping us understand in terms of technology. Um, Empo, one thing that just kind of stuck out to me is just the level of overwhelmingness and anxiety that folks face is it's exhausting being on Zoom meetings. Um, and the last thing we will ever want to do is impact our patient partners. Um, do you have any tips for patient partners, what they can do to kind of you know, express some of uh, their things with the researcher or ways that, or tips that they can use um, to not feel overwhelmed or deal with some of that anxiety? Um, good question. <laughs> I, well, I think uh, first they're building that relationship uh, when you're talking with the patient partners, just uh, ask them how they're feeling, how they're doing, uh, just talking to them on a personal level. I think that will kind of reduce the anxiety to start with. And, um, you know, even Zoom meetings uh, now, you don't have to be sitting uh, at a table, you know, you can be doing Zoom meetings, standing up, walking, doing something just to kind of take your mind off or <laughs> be active a little bit. So things like that, yeah, take some breaks in between if you're doing meetings, maybe, you know, talk 10 minutes, 20 minutes and have a five minutes break in between, and then come back. Yeah. I don't know if you want to have anything else to add. <laughs> um, I think the only thing I would add or suggest sometimes is if you're able to like go outside um, and like even sit on your backyard and have the meeting, that's pretty nice. Like sometimes I just go outside and study outside all day or just work all day uh, from like outside on the table in my backyard. And that's, it's really nice because first it doesn't make me feel that I'm like just in the same, between the same four walls all day. Um, but like at least there's like a squirrel going by or or like the air or an airplane or like anything it's kind of like makes you feel more normal in a sense um and breathing uh, the air the fresh air is, i don't know it, sometimes even it's more productive and more relaxing i think than just uh, it makes might make you feel more like a comfortable environment and less formal in a sense um like still keeping the formality of the meeting And also, I think uh, also uh, taking a break, uh, like right now it's summer, so I want to, uh, it'd be good not to schedule anything this summer, July, August, we'll just give everybody a break from the Zoom and uh, resume in September. I think that that, that kind of, you know, we know, we know this pandemic so is not going away anytime, so we're going to September come school starts, we're going to be full on speed again. So I think this break of July, August, not having to do much Zoom. That'd be great. Um, we can't avoid that because we're still working full time. But uh, anything else that's not like you know, agent, you can you know, if your research is gonna, you can if your research is taking a while to to complete, you can kind of plan to say, okay, you know, maybe I can I don't have to schedule uh, any meetings with patients between uh, the summer. I can start in the fall. You know, just give uh, a little bit of break on on. Uh, doing online so that I can enjoy the, the weather <laughs> outside. No, that's a, that's a good point too. Um, and then another topic, um, and this comes up all the time and it's a tough one, uh, is what about communities that don't have access to the internet? Um, how do we know what kind of internet or cell phone access is available in different communities. Um, somebody asked if there's a report that shows this information. I'm not sure about that for Manitoba. Um, I'm not sure if either of you know or if any of our team does. Uh, I think it's, you know, knowing the communities you're working with and um, what kind of access they have. And I think we mentioned before trying to look at other options um, when you can't do in person people are going to be left out. Um, you know, it might be phone calls if you're able to. Um, I know one researcher, um, and I mentioned this in our a previous panel, 
Um, one researcher just talked to the community and said, you know what, we're going to have to take a break because this is just people have other things to focus on. This online is too stressful. Um, something. So yeah, I don't know if you guys have thoughts around that and the lack of internet access. Yeah, that, that, that's a big one there, uh, lack of internet access. Um, I mean, if you, you have not, if you have no access, uh, the only way is to go to them, uh, directly talk to them in person. Um, but with the restrictions right now, I don't know what else you can do, but I think, uh, you know, in those situations, you can avoid talking to them in person. Yeah, I think it's it's a tough question too. Um, that it's kind of hard to answer. I think like no one really has a good answer for it, um, just because the situation impedes a lot of people from going um, to different communities and and that. But I think in terms of engaging, and I think this goes back a bit to the question that I answered um, before about how to engage kind of like youth people. Um, I think also reaching out to like the healthcare providers who for example like focus on that certain condition uh, would be helpful in trying to engage the patients who don't have access to technology or who wouldn't found about who would not find out about all these um, groups and opportunities through through the internet um, I think that if like one of my doctors had told me before like oh there's this research opportunity or like there's this group um, that does this, uh, like just besides kind of my appointment on its own, then that would have been a step ahead from me as a patient having to go through all the research, my own research stuff to find the, yeah, to engage in the research itself. So, so I think also trying to find those liaisons that won't, might, might not be online, might be able, might be helpful to engage the people who don't have like maybe they don't have Facebook or they don't know how to use Reddit or things like that. That's a really good point. Uh, and I hadn't thought of that. We've looked at things um, like I've explored the option of um, how we could provide patient partners with um, access to the internet to join the zoom meeting, for example. And so that you know, I, I went down a rabbit hole um, and I asked Reddit <laughs> and, uh, you know, answers were things from like buying a, a prepaid cell phone with a SIM card and paying for a month of internet access um, on a prepaid um, cell phone. Um, there, there weren't a lot of options. Most internet um, providers, uh, you know, are monthly based. Um, Oh, we have someone mentioning TELUS is providing internet to people on provincial disability and she'll have a link for that. So I think too, exploring those kind of options, um, we've had, uh, we have an award for people to engage in the early stages of research and we've seen um, researchers using those funds to pay for things like a tablet for a patient partner um, to be able to work online. I think too, uh, for communities, or people who don't, who have spotty internet access. So say, you know, if they're on a Zoom meeting, it's constantly lagging or their video's not coming through and they just have a bad connection. Um, looking at uh, asynchronous, so not real time ways of uh, communicating. So like chat boards, message boards where you, it also gives you the chance to take time to respond to other people and think about your answers, but it also allows you to, you know, maybe utilize those times of day where your internet's a little better or it doesn't require you to have a really good connection to, you know, respond to a message in a forum. Um, so that's, yeah, again, things like Discord or um, Facebook, Reddit, that kind of thing. I, can I add a little comment to that? I've seen um, some people said there's landlines you can use. Um, it's tough for communities who are isolated and the last thing we want to do is isolate them further. I know, Anita, you talked about how you don't know when opportunities exist, but we can search it up and see, because a lot of times when we, are, we do have a condition, it's helpful to normalize it when we see a group of people or be part of research and try to make a difference for ourselves and others in a similar circumstances. But unfortunately, communities that are isolated don't 
cannot easily access or have that communication or no research exists. But as researchers, it is our duty and our job to bridge that gap. And if it cannot be internet, then there are other ways. We can connect with communities via radio. I've heard of people doing that. Um, there are nursing stations where you can post things. Landlines, as someone mentioned, um, we need to find ways, but also advocate that there needs to be internet access to places as well. And we need to bring some equity and equality in, in those terms. But in, in, the, in the meanwhile, we can kind of be creative in ways uh, of how we can communicate and make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. Yeah, I also like to mention that, you know, uh, in Africa, we do have lots of rural communities where they don't have internet, they're like isolated, um, uh, isolated places. And there's a technology that built for that. I think that those can be explored and see how they can be used here. I know there's a, a few companies in Vancouver who develop technology for Africa for rural communities. So we can look at that and see if uh, that can be tailored to communities here. Um, to provide uh, those uh, uh, services, uh, technology to be able to engage with them here. Yeah. I think uh, like one of the probably most important parts uh, to bridging that is first engaging them in the research and then kind of like once they're engaged, like getting to them, then there's other ways that you can figure out and how you will kind of like run focus groups or run your meetings. Um, but I think the most important part is first approaching these communities. Um, so I think, yeah, like, especially like, kind of go back to that point where patients, well, they will probably need to go to their, to their doctor at some point. So then like if their, if their healthcare provider told them like, there's this research opportunity, um, I can tell them that you're interested and then like the researcher can do their part in order to, in order to get to that community end. Um, try to figure out a way that it'll work for those patients. Great. Um, what an excellent conversation. Um, thank you both uh, Juanita and Ampo for your perspectives. Thanks to all our participants um, for sharing their thoughts and suggestions. Um, I'll do a final plug here. Um, if you'd like to learn more about patient engagement and view past lunchtime learning sessions, um, you can visit our uh, YouTube, which is not on there, but I believe we have a link on our website. Um, and I've also shared it at the beginning in the chat. Um, follow us on Twitter, um, our CHI account. We also have a blog called Knowledge Nudge with some great PE resources. Um, we're also on Facebook. Um, or you can always send us an email uh, to the PE team at chipartners at umanitoba.ca. Um, so if you have any questions, comments for us or for the collaborative partnership, we can definitely uh, pass those along. And um, so this concludes our uh, lunchtime learning for the 2020-2021 season. Thank you both for sending us off. Um, I hope everyone has a great summer and stay uh, safe, uh, happy and healthy. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, everybody have a great day. I'm going to end the meeting now. Take care. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you.